Right, so I, I, I gave you this uh, intro the other day where I wanted to frame at the start just how important stories are. And I added some more material here, right? We had a question, I think, from Todd, right? So this was not supposed to be exhaustive. It's like I'm throwing some things up, but I've added you know, religion here, of course. Uh, was a massive one that's here. Freemasonry, I'll put that down. Um, uh, I actually grew up in an area where Freemasonry was quite strong. You know, everyone, it turned out, was a Freemason. Um, and they tried to recruit you at some point. So, uh, strange business. Except women, of course, they did not recruit women. Um, okay. They said they were very inclusive. Uh, so, all sorts of that, right? So, the stories for countries, cities, all sorts of groups that are coherent uh, in some way. Right. And they're, they're, they're kind of they're competing storytelling entities. And a lot of these stories are about how to live your life. Not all of them. Went through this Pantheon piece, which was to show that over time, and I, I think maybe especially this image showed the rise of the storyteller as this really important key part of society. And, and you know, sports, in a way, give us this very spontaneous storytelling thing. Okay, so let's move on to some other pieces. These are recent books. I just wanted to highlight these. You might be interested in them, but they have different framing. So this is a, I know I mentioned this the other day, this is the evolution of stories. I'm right? talking about them in a uh, kind of a um, Darwinian kind of way. No, it doesn't fit exactly. So meme, the word meme comes from, so people know where it comes from? It's Richard Dawkins, right? It's the... Um, the Selfish Gene, that book, introduced the, he introduced the idea of meme, and it's supposed to be this cultural unit. Um, which, you know, and I think that, I kind of think the better framing is, is more, more generally story. Of course, memes have become a meme, right? They've survived. They are a cultural unit now, but they mean ridiculous little videos, right? So that's what everyone thinks of memes. You know, I've had 12-year-olds explain to me what memes are when I tried to tell them about Dawkins. Anyway, but it um, <laughs> didn't go well. <laughs> like, but anyway, so uh, I will say that the whole interest in this is a side thing, but all the stuff about cooperation and selfishness, and you'll see a lot of work uh, where cooperation is framed as this kind of extraordinary thing that emerges in large populations, and how do we study it? And it's very much to me the it, the opposite is the interesting thing, right? So people are cooperative locally, and they create these large groups that are very um, non-cooperative with respect to other large groups. And that's our big concern. I mean, people have um, generally, except for sociopaths, have uh, built in you know, social tendencies to reciprocate and do all these sorts of things with each other. OK, and it's more at that larger scale. And then I think the final part in that little story is that uh, the interest in cooperation of individuals, like why do individuals cooperate with each other, comes from people who are sociopaths, right? So they're economists and so on, right? So, um, because their world is one that's, sorry, their, their world is one that, uh, you know, they've defeated all of their foes as they got tenure and so on. So they don't understand cooperation. Um, anyway, whereas most normal people do. So this is, a, this, then this is a different framing. This is about how, you know, that stories are essential to us. There's, there's any number of these books, you know, why, why salt transformed the world, why, you know, the mollusk made America great. You know, like there's all these sorts of books, right? There's millions of books that have this kind of framing of, you know, why chickens are, you know, the reason for the existence of whatever, you know. Anyway. They get carried away. But I do think this is really a powerful one. Everything matters. I mentioned this again too. Uh, this thing, I know we watched this, but I kind of want to watch this again because I want you to, I, I so the big triangle is in this space to start with, right? So you could listen. So these, they, this, they could be thieves, for example, right? The sound, I'm not sure about. The, it seems unnecessary, right? So there's, they, they come, and I don't think I, when I was watching again, I missed that. But um, see, going in to steal some things, maybe. Anyway, and at the end, and I'm not, I have trouble speeding this up. Can I do that? No, I can't speed up. At the end, the big triangle smashes everything to pieces. So worth watching again and maybe reading that paper. Okay, so let's have a definition of a story. So this is very milky and not necessarily, you know, finished at all. I mean, all of this is developmental. That's what I'm kind of showing you, although there are some pieces in the next three lectures that are very well established, you know. So I'm trying to tie a lot of things together. 
So I'm going to say a story of some sequence of uh, events. It's, and and I'm, it doesn't have to be, but I think temporal, you know, there's some temporal, right? There's some aspect, at least, of causality usually involved, right? There's some logic to it. So that's a simple thing. And it can be just a, like, if then, you know, if this, then that. It can be just a tiny little algorithmic step, right? And so that, that's where, and I'll say this again, we get to proverbs, for example, you know. Little, little, tiny little, and they can be more in the form of, you know, telling you how to behave, but they're like little microscopic stories. So they go from small to very, very large. Uh, events, of course, can be any, you know, balance of, of real and imagined ones. And, and often uh, with us, we can't help but throw in some imagined things. We love that sort of stuff. Uh, I mean, it is peculiar to me in some ways that, I mean, I think wonderful perhaps, that the most, you know, totally fictional works are the most powerful for us in some ways. Um, I think I'll have something more to say about that. Yeah. You know, things that are completely made up or in a sense, you know, they could be about aliens or whatever, but they, they, they can have great effects on us. So I think this is generally thought to be reasonable that when people talk about narratives and stories, they, they, they're using them interchangeably, right? There are, you know, I, I, again, people can make up all sorts of definitions here, but that's fairly solid. This, I've just stolen this from Wikipedia, actually. But whereas a plot is a different thing. So a plot is the underlying logic of a story, right? And there's some arguments about all sorts of things here. Um, there's a Russian framing of very much this, this, this idea that there's a plot in a story, that there's something that really happens and then as a story gets told about it. But of course, and there's a lot of postmodernism criticism of that because this goes back the other way, right? So you hear this and then you start to deduce things about plot. And of course, if you're trying to do anything, uh, you know, disinformation and so on, this is just a field day for you, right? Because you can sort of insinuate all sorts of things happened underneath by not exactly saying them. Uh, but the idea of the plot is that it's, uh, that there are causal links, right? This is a so and a so, right? One causes four, causes eight, but you know, you tell all these things. Uh, it doesn't have to be in the same time order. If you, maybe you've seen Memento, it's an older film now, but, um, you know, that, or, you know, Pulp Fiction, right? I mean, these, these things are not in time order um, or in kind of any ethical order as well, but uh, they're, you know, very disturbing or anything to do with Doctor Who, which makes no sense whatsoever. Um, <clears throat> time travelers, wow, that is, that is a bad business for stories, but people, we, can't, we can't help ourselves. I have a piece about that. I should write that down. I'll see if I can dig that up. I mean, it's really a fiasco um, in, in, uh, in stories. Nothing makes sense. Except for, is it Looper? No, what's it called? Is it Looper? What's the book? Looper? No, no, no. Back to the Future is, of course, but um, and it's pretty good, you know. Doc Brown with the explanation on the board. Yeah. One point twenty one. What's that? The one I've got. You know, I'll have it here. I'll show. I'll, I'll, I'll have it here. I, do, I know it's on a on a thing. It's a very deep effort to try and make it actually work. All right. So I'll, I'll make this as assignation plot and algorithms are the same, sort of in the same bucket, right? So they. And I know people have very different ideas potentially about algorithm, but I feel like we can do that. We're all set. We're all set. OK. All right, so hopefully you acted independently. The next plan here, thank you, is to good. So now we're going to go around again. That's the second column is for you to look at what everyone else has done. And now collect this is different, right? So the winning the delicious chocolate arm, coated almonds is the first column. This one is a team effort. We're going to try and get it as close as we can to the real answer. So you want to use what the collective intelligence of everyone else and, and put in what you think is the, the best answer. <laughs> so now you can game it however you want, right? It's going to be the average. Well, maybe I'll take the medium, but it's going to be the average of the second column. It's going to be our best effort, right? So you're trying to get the right thing. You don't have to think too much about this, but basically look through it. Look at your thing, you know, were you super high, were you super low, whatever. Or, you know, and if you think everyone is wrong, Neptune is your thing, parsecs are your thing, you know all about it, then you hold fast, right? So it's up to you. This is, but, but
But what you want is the average to work out. So do as you will. And so just work them through and, and pass them on. All right, good. OK, so I'm going to say this, plot an algorithm. I'm going to sort of connect those things together. But this is, a, I think, a, a, a fairly general, I mean, obviously, very general definition of story. Time is involved, right? There's some time aspect here. Um, I know you could still describe something flatly, but uh, even then, there's a ordering that you're forced because you're telling it. You know, you, there's time running as you either read the book or you or someone tells a story. So we're trying to work. I think uh, you know many people now. I think are sort of getting on board with stories. You see it framed in all sorts of ways. Uh, we just had this science of story symposium, which was great. We had you know folklore people, all sorts of people coming in. Uh, so I don't know what we'll end up calling, but a science of stories of some sort. And, and you know, if we go back in time, right, the rise of propaganda led to communication departments. Actually, the Second World War, and, and as far as I understand, talking to the sort of many, I guess, the famous folklore people in the US, folklore departments have gone away. There's only one PhD left, uh, and that's at Indiana. I believe that's right. And the story is it's, the, it's because of um, the Second World War, because of Nazism. It, it got looked down upon because you know, folklore was used as, in this negative way. But it seems a, a, lo a real loss to sort of just say, let's not study this anymore. Let's not you know, think about it. So, um, so there's, been, you know, th there's been a sort of a, a descent in that area. OK. Uh, so, you know, claim, claim and, uh, and as I showed with these books, right, that, that um, you know, people run on stories. I have this thing, homo narrativus. Uh, these are just some fun things, right? We use stories all the time. What's the John Dory, right? That's the sort of theme for this class that uh, rhymes with story. That's actually a very common, when I, at least when I was in Australia, that people would say that all the time. What's the story? You know, like, what's the story with this thing? What's, you know, they'd say, what, in, even, even in, um, you know, saying hello. And, and you would say, what's the John Dory? Uh, you talk about someone losing the plot or the thread, right? When they've gone off the reservation or whatever's happened to them, um, they've you know lost the the story. So those three bullet points are you know, just around the idea that we are storytelling entities. Uh, narrative hierarchy is a, another piece I have here. Maybe we can talk about that. But uh, scalability of stories, right? So I guess it's it's captured here. So the, not the best stories, but really strong stories are going to have like a uh, a condensed version up here, you know, and this will be two, two words, three words that somehow capture it, right? So this is your slogan or your catchphrase out to some deep body of work. And, uh, the, you know, so this is an example where these things don't fit together, right? This is some basically lies being told about some true thing. Uh, and the idea is to fit them together if you can, right? So. Uh, and this is really about knowledge, right? So that you are actually telling something really condensed that's, that's true here, but of course it's only two or three words. So let's see, I have a whole piece on this. And I don't really know how to you know, make this work properly, right? But I have 10 levels here of, of stories. So there's you know, one, one to two, three word encapsulation, um, right? The Big Bang, for example. That's good work by physicists, even though we don't understand it. Um, <laughs> But it you know, tells you something. Then, then sentences, a few sentences right out to a paragraph. Uh, log lines for movies, that's how movies are stored. Or you know, there's a one or two sentence paraphrasing of it. Uh, you know, and this, uh, OK, and then out to these things, right? So out to a, like a large coherent body of work, which is like the Marvel Universe or religious scripts, a number of things, right? And then some stuff here about how these things do or don't work and the misuse of them, right? So disinformation. Um, yep, yep, yep. Anyway, I think this is a kind of a big deal. So perhaps the way things, and I'm, this is the way things are being talked about now, uh, is that the, the left is, is actually bad at this, right? They're bad at this part, you know? Trumped up, trickle down economics was a line that Clinton used in one of the debates. And it's just like, she was trying to like wham him. And it's like, oof, that's, it just, it just doesn't have the, it didn't have rhetorical strength. Um, and, and it's not to say they don't, right? So they, they can have all of this, but they're having trouble 
And so there's, there is a sort of a framing now that the left can't meme, but the right can meme. And, you know, I don't know. They, they definitely need some work, right? They definitely need some work, right? So, and we'll come to one of the, these frames later on, but uh, uh, the original, I'm just talking about slogans and, and they're not everything, but they're, they're very important. So Clinton's first one was, um, I'm with her, which isn't, you know, about the ascent of uh, uh, a country or something, right? It's just, you know, it, it's, it's a weird framing. And then it was stronger together after that. There, there's also whether the, the framing can be used against you, right? Like flipped in some way, right? Can it be mocked, you know, badly? Can you, can you make them sound ridiculous? So, um, uh, so in Australia, there's a long time ago in the 90s, the, uh, the Labor Party, which is the left-wing party, was, had been in for many years and, it, you know, things had gone to pieces. They were going to get voted out for sure. And ridiculously, what's called the Liberal Party in Australia, which is the right side, um, all they had to do was just turn up, right? They had to just say nothing, just smile and nod. It was one of those situations. This happens, you know, periodically in countries where you just don't say anything, right? Because the other team has made such a mess that you'll get voted in. So idiotically, they decided to, you know, frame a whole thing that they were going to build for the country, and they called it the Fight Back Package. And the uh, Prime Minister at the time, Paul Keating, got up in Parliament and, for Monty Python fans, did the whole dead parrot sketch and just use the word package every time he was supposed to say parrot. And he recited it from memory, basically. And so it's parliament system. One side is laughing and just, you know, killing themselves, and the other side is jeering and so on. And, and you know, it's like some sort of bad kindergarten situation. But this is how it works in the parliament system. And they lost, you know, they lost, right? They lost. The, the, the liberals lost. They should have just walked straight in, said nothing about what they were going to do. Um, Anyway, they, they made something that could be pilloried, and, and it was, and it's all just words. But you've got, to be, you've got to be incredibly careful. All right, so this is just one slide to say that are trying to build the science of stories. And, and you know, a number of you are sort of working on Twitter things. Um, you know, we're up to 10 years of that, but that's, that's, that's just part of it, right? So how do we get all these things out of text? Metaphors, for example, like that's just, that's an uns that's, there are only a few papers on this recently, you know, in the last five years. It's a really hard problem. I uh, had a great student in Parks work on this uh, at some point. Very tough. How do we just get out narrative? How do we get out the, not just, so here's sort of the story. That's what we're trying to do with this thing called Story Wrangler. Here's the, uh, you know, here's an event that happened in the world and how is it being framed, right? How many different dimensions of, of stories are being told about it? Uh, you know, and we're, we're for some of the things that have happened more recently in time, we, I think we're getting to a point where we're very aware of what will happen. Like, you know, Parkland, for example, um, uh, that the, the idea of crisis actor was right there, right? So that, that, and that emerged the next day. It was all over YouTube, all of these videos that, that claimed this. Um, you know, these are, so in terms of predictability, I suppose we're getting there with some of these things, but being able to actually detect in real time disinformation Right, these different frames, we should be able to do it. And I know I've showed you little bits of this in the, in the past. What's the taxonomy of human stories? I'll come back to this later on. Like what's the, what's the for a particular culture, what are the kinds of stories they go back to over and over again? Again, what are the stories that they can understand? You know, there's this general idea that the West is good at individual stories and the East is better at collective stories. I mean, incredibly important for cultures and how they, they run. And this idea of stories and algorithms. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, so they're everywhere. I'm going to say algorithms are everywhere. This is a uh, so there's a recent paper talking about what we need to think about stories in economics, right? Think about how people behave. This is um, for economists. You might want to look at this one. Um, you know, and this is now thinking about more about the algorithm aspect. You know, legal systems are full of algorithms, right? So if you do this, then this happens. Uh, well, I'll come back to that with adjacent narratives. Um, lots, of, lots of algorithmic structures. Food, the way food works. Safety codes, all these sorts of things. And I'm going to say stories. So this is, you know, we had all this success with calculus and differential equations describing all of these um, continuous phenomena, which are everywhere, right? I mean, they're, we, fluids, for example, which I'll come back to at the end of the course, is a ubiquitous phenomenon and we have this kind of amazing way we, we've come to understand we can just des describe it with the Navier-Stokes equations. 
it's an unbelievable success in terms of understanding complex systems. Um, but the right, as you go through the evolution of uh, a universe, if things keep going, then algorithms, algorithms, algorithms take over, right? It's a lift from raw physics and randomness and so on into algorithmic behaviors. And really, the advent of life is the start of algorithms. So more about algorithms, right? So this is, again, these are all really recent things, which I, you know, this is, this is stuff that's super taking off. So this is a, this is seeing the economic phenomena as, as code, right? Um, this is, so these are, these are very nice. So this one is how to learn, uh, helping you learn computer science by talking about folklore or stories, uh, folk stories or um, folk tales. So, for example, you know, Hansel and Gretel is a search problem and leaving crumbs and all this sort of stuff. So how is that done versus, you know, other ways to search things? That's them there, I suppose, they're, they're little crumbs. So this is, a, this is for a computer science class, right? So you can understand algorithms better by talking about stories. And then this is the other way around. These are taking all sorts of computer science algorithms that have been developed to solve all sorts of problems and then how to use them in your own life or whatever organization you're in. And I think this is done. This is done very, very well. It's not like, you know, everything should be. It's just like here. Oh, look, look. Here's some stuff we, uh, you know, figured out how to, you know, search problems, um, <laughs> how to s sequence things, all sorts of stuff that really matter and are really, you know, important in, in, in computer science. And it's all emerged over the last what 70 years. Uh, and you, know, you can use this. You know. Right, cooking, right? I know I had that on the other page, but cooking, recipes, yeah? And that's, that pops up here, right? So I have it here, yes. Numerical Rep Recipes in C, very famous book, Numerical Recipes in Fortran. I don't know if they keep making them. Do they have them in Python? But these are actually, these are actually some of the best books there are around for, um, for understanding algorithms, for understanding like some statistical packages and so on or statistical techniques, I should say. There's like two or three pages where they describe it and then they have the algorithm. And, but the framing of these, these algorithms being recipes. Um, and then this is how to bake pie. Okay, this is, uh, this is math through, um, uh, thinking about mathematical, actually it's more about math stuff, pure math, um, through, through recipes. Very enjoyable, well done. Okay, so, just giving you things, right? So adjacent narratives. So this is something I keep trying to understand for myself. Um, and I'm just sort of constructing this. So this is the story versus perhaps plot a little bit, but it's, it's a departure from that in some ways, right? So this, if you can see this, there's this gray, these gray dots in the background. And that, they're the same for all of these, right? There's this little pattern here, and it's really this one. Right, in the middle there. So that's, let's say this is something that truly happened, right? These are some events that happened. I'm not gonna have multiverse, whatever, nonsense and things. Like this, the, this was a sequence of events, the causal in some way. And so these, these are then retellings or versions of this, this story, right? So this one, you know, actually has the, the same events in it, but misses these ones and adds a few different ones and connects them, right, for example. This one has a completely different track that ends up with the same story. This one just tells you piecemeal. Uh, this one's completely off in terms of it. This one starts in the same way and then they depart. And then there are all these events around, this is just to sort of show there are all these events around the actual events, which connects to this picture, which is that there's an infinitude of stories adjacent to the real one. All right, so this, so I have the three points I wanna make about this. But this is in a sense, kind of a great beauty of stories, but it's a hu huge problem for us when it comes especially to disinformation and, and just getting things wrong, is that, you know, just take Moby Dick and just change one sentence, right? Just change one sentence a little bit and then do that to every sentence. Maybe not call me Ishmael, but like change little things, right? So, and then change maybe two sentences and it's a combinatorial explosion, right? There's an um, and this is not, not changing it in any substantive way, just little tiny bits. So you get to an, an ex combinatorial explosion of stories that are, that are essentially the same story, right? I mean, if you're just changing tiny pieces. But then you can make the whale a kraken or something like that, right? You could start to change it and you could call it Floyd, 
right? You could, you could give it a different feel. And then it could be, you know, a, about, you know, snakes in Australia or something, like the giant snake that gets you. It could, right, completely different thing. You know, and we're good at trans, you know, with the stories we really like, like West Side Story is Romeo and Juliet. You know, we're good at um, the ones we really like. We'll, we'll be able to place them in different, different spaces. Uh, so there's, there, are the, there, are, there are tiny modifications that show that this just explodes. Like if you think of the bull, if you like, in mathematical or, or, or sort of the adjacent, what I'm going to say, this adjacent narratives, it's unbelievably rich and, and full. And so a couple of things arise from that. This is, this is the story that gets told by the person who can't sort out meaning, right? They just go on detours, which I guess you might think is me, but they go on to detours and explain all these little extra pieces, right? Um, it doesn't happen as much anymore, but you know, people with directions, you know, you ask like, how do you get from A to B? And some people will, you know, they tell you exactly, you know, just enough. And then there'll be the person who says, you know, and then you go past, there's a red mailbox. Now the person who lives in that house came from, you know, and they just, just tell me how to get there. You know, like, <laughs> um, so, you know, figuring out how to tell your story, you know, like that's the narrative hierarchy. You've got, you know, there's the elevator pitch idea, right? You know, what, what's the, What's the circumstance? Here we have 75 minutes, so I will cruelly say as much as I want. But, uh, you know, if we had five minutes, you'd just go and you'd adjust. Some people don't adjust, they don't care, you know. So that possibly explains your Thanksgiving dinner with um, whoever. All right. Uh, so this is what I'm going to say about uh, the, this kind of just observation of this infinitude of stories around a true one. So the first thing is, you can't write this kind of, you can't record a real story, right? We can, we're getting close with some events with video where it becomes somewhat harder to say different things happened. Although, amazingly, that's not entirely the case, right? It's like, you know, there's actual video of something and it's still argued about, you know? Or like giant pictures of like crowd sizes, for example. You know, like stuff to which, which you would, it's not just words anymore, right? It's actual pictures and things, but we, we, we're, we're pretty good. And of course, we, we're entering into a very dangerous time where we can potentially certainly manipulate images, but video is kind of coming, right? The, these sort of things where you can make, I mean, there are, there's, thank you, deep learning. There are efforts to like make, uh, you know, say a president say anything you want, right? Or, like actually visually say it. And those things are not great yet from what I've seen, right? They don't look good, they don't, they're not convincing. But people are clever and relentless one day, and you could potentially make a video of anyone you want saying anything you want. For now, we have an emoji on, on iPhones, you know, and that's, <laughs> we think that's awesome. Although, you know, <laughs> I did want to replace my whole course with an an emoji thing, but it only goes for 10 seconds, but anyway. <laughs> so disappointing. Uh, <clears throat> you know, clean up the. <laughs> So, uh, okay, so you can't re record every detail, right? I'm gonna give you three things. You can't record every detail. That's just gonna be impossible. Even with video, you know, you can't have every aspect or whatever it is. So that's fine, that's always been true. Um, so you're gonna be compressing in some way as well because you've got, you know, so many words to, to, to con you know, uh, convey the thing. There are many other things to talk about, so as time goes on, you know, if we look back in history, I think there's an interesting thing, like we can sort of remember, not everything survives, of course, but you know, we'll say for a whole century, this is the thing that happened basically, right? You know, now we have this incredible density of, of stuff. Um, <clears throat> that's just a bias, of course. So story logic will be favored on top of that, right? So we're gonna leave out kind of weird little random details. We're gonna miss them. I mean, there's all sorts of psychological stuff about this. Um, work on this, uh, we're, we're good at missing things if they don't make any sense. Like the, the famous one is the, it, does this hold up? I have to ask the resident psychologist. The gorilla walking around amongst people, has that been reproduced? It's been reproduced a lot, a lot but I think that most people sort of are aware of. They know it. Do you know about this one? Have you heard of this one? So it's, I'll just, yeah, it's worth watching because I, I think people still have trouble with it, right? Like. There are six people on a basketball court and they're just passing a ball. So three are passing it one way and three are passing the other way. So it's just the two circles kind of like this. I think roughly something like that. This is just sort of a, like this stuff going on. Yeah, there's movement. Like people are moving around while they're passing basketball. 
And you're supposed to just watch that, right? right. That's all you're asked no, you're to do. You're supposed to count how many times oh, you, the ball passes. Okay, you're given a task, right? Yeah. And then someone in a gorilla suit just walks through the whole thing. Just walks through it. And what percentage of people, like? Low, most people miss it. Most people miss this. They like just do not see it, right? They just do not see it. And then you can watch it again and they'll still miss it because they're <laughs> concentrating on this task. I mean, this is why you shouldn't text and drive, right? I mean, because we, you know, we've only so much we can, we can do. And I know Pratchett's sort of my favorite author, Terry Pratchett, but he has, you know, death is a character in Pratchett and uh, he simply walks amongst people, right? And uh, the issue with death is no one, no one is gonna see a seven foot grim reaper. So they just fill it in with normality, except children and cats, yeah. Their brains are not whatever. But you know, adults, we're really good at just like, ah, that did, that's, not, that's not even, that's just, that's just a tree. <laughs> Sorry. If, yes. So the, if the real story, is there like a real story that exists in a cave? Is that distinct from? I'm, I'm going to say there was a sequence of events in history, right? There really, you know, things really happened. Like a tree really fell in the forest and it really did make a noise. That's a garbage is koan, that, by the way. Um, is that a, totally so did. You're saying that's this is also the sound of one story. hand clapping. What's it? A true story, then, is what actually, what actually happened is a true story. <laughs> See, the knowledge. What's <laughs> What actually happened is a true story? Well, I mean, that, you know, I'm just going to, and I'm going to say, and I know we could all be brains in boxes or whatever, but I'm going to say there was really some history, and it's not forking. There aren't multiverses. I know that might be disappointing, but, um, <laughs> you know, but I, I there's energetic conservation at least, are, are right? True, I guess my question is, then, are true events a story, or is the story only once we start retelling it? Um, so I'm going to, yeah, focus a little more on human stories, right? So I think the way we retell it is the, is the story, yeah. But octopuses could tell a story. But I do want to say that there is, uh, well, so are all th th there's, the, there's the retelling, and, and there, is a, there are various versions of it. Right? There's the, you could say there's the plot and the story, right, which I had before. So the, okay. the plot would be the, the actual sequence of events. Okay. You know, and the causal things, like this happened and this happened. Right? The plot for fluid mechanics is the Navier-Stokes equation. Right? That's the mechanic that explains, like, Fluid to here, and it's going to be here in the next <laughs> instant. Right. But you know, like someone pushes, gravity's going to make whatever, like there's something that happens. Like a Buster Keaton, Laurel and Hardy. Does anyone know who these people are? This is amazing to me. Laurel no one. Hardy. Yeah? Laurel and Hardy. You know? Yeah. Not many people do. Okay, so these are the early movie things, yes? Right? I've asked people. People, people don't know anymore. Anyway, but these are the early slapstick. Right, you know, like being hit with a, the guys with ladders, you know, everyone's getting hit with a ladder, that sort of business. Anyway, no one knows about these things. Um, I'm not sure what the addition was there, but um, there's, so real, you know, real things, you know, there is an actual, you know, history, and then we're going to tell stories, so we'll call that the plot, right, if you like, and then there are, and some of that's going to be random, that's a problem, right, there's going to be just random stuff that happens, and when we tell stories, that's one of the things we want to iron out. We're not really great at that. Now and then we can handle it. You know, if it's really too much, we'll say, you know, the French have c'est la vie. Um, there are various versions of that in um, English. And this comes back, this is from Wolfgang Mieter, who's the world's leader in um, Proverbs, who's over here in Russian and German. I remember telling, telling me one of his favorite Proverbs of the last um, second half of the 20th century is and it's S-H-I-T happens, right? So it's a, I can't even swear in class. So it's a, and, and that's very commonly used and it comes from the GIs after the Second, War, Second World War coming back. That's the American version of C'est la vie. <laughs> Doesn't have, yeah. <laughs> it's funny because the English would use C'est la vie. Like they'd use, they just wholly take it, you know. They'd say that's life a little bit, but you would actually like give it a bit of lift by using the, the French. So, Story logic, the, the way we tell stories, we're not good at randomness, and it depends on your culture, right? So the Western culture is a little more about individ, individual narratives, so we'll try to explain it as a function of individuals. Um, okay, so that's, that's just sort of step one. That just means in retelling a story, you're going to get into, you're going to get it some way away from what really happened. And this, you know, so journalists are in here, right? Journalists are in here, that good, good, you know, journalism in general is uh, the, you know, very good people, right? My wife's one of them. And uh, 
they're scientists with a deadline, right? So um, they're trying to do this all the time. Opinions are a different thing, so opinions get further away. So, so there, here's the second big piece, I think, in here, is that there are better stories away from the, what really happened. They're in the sense that they will, they will go into your brain better. They'll be, you want to tell them, right? You want to spread them. So there are three pieces here. They're more engaging, right? They're more appealing to our story minds, more motivating to spread, and they're more durable under spreading, right? They're the, they're the best stories, right? So that you tell, they have a coherence to them that doesn't get broken down. You know, this is the telephone game. This has changed, I suppose, because, uh, you know, everything is online now and you can have immediate, you know, communication about something. So people, you know, the durability of something can be higher because you can point to it. Um, the gain there becomes, you know, how much are these stories fighting against each other? The durability, right? Do they persist? Because you can go and find, you know, whatever it is, a video on YouTube, this, this tells you something. Uh, so better stories, therefore, are going to exist for people like journalists who are going to try to retell, right? So you're going to distill it into a better story. There's this real one that happens, and there's adjacent to it a better one in the sense that it's the right length. Uh, it kind of hits on some things that matter for your culture or what's happened in the past. They're going to, in a, you know, it's a faithful effort, right? It's a faithful effort, but they're going to go towards a story that seems more compelling, right? And, and so this is a slippery slope, right? You can get into trouble because you try to maybe, um, you know, uh, augment something that's not really true or you sort of see something and you think it's true. So, so this goes, this is where some things go wrong, okay? And then, the, but the third thing is, um, oh yeah, let's do it all again. Look at the second column and make a better third column. <laughs> Let's see if you can get better and then get better again. Don't get worse. Let's try to do that, right? But you know the game now. Are you taking the average or the median? Average. I will look at, I'll, I'll have to look at different things. If the number's wildly off, we should just like, like put a really big negative. So bad. All right, no. Let's assume I will do different statistics, and one of them might be the median. Yeah, because you're right. Your motivation is right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. These people are crazy. <laughs> That's good. Okay, so the third thing, so of three, is that um, better stories are, are sitting there waiting for you around the true one if you want to do something bad, right? So if you are into disinformation, then or or you have an ideology and you can sort of imagine here's the real story and there's this just many dimensions around it, like going off in many, many dimensions and here's the one that's you know, your political stripe and here's the one that's someone else's political stripe. You, know, you kind of move out in this direction, you move out in this direction. I mean, legal cases, right? Think about um, like prosecuting someone in, in a legal case, right? So the defense is going to move out in one direction and say, yeah, they didn't, you know, like the glove didn't fit, right? So this, uh, you know, it couldn't have happened, right? This is, they're going to argue that there are all these facts that people agree on, but here is how my client was, you know, not involved. And then uh, the prosecutors are going to say, well, st stitch it all together. And in some sense, I think they're going to go to the edge of the envelope of credibility, right? So they might go a little too far, but there's going to be some sort of envelope of believability around uh, a particular real story. That envelope can get stretched, right? That can get pretty stretched. And um, okay, so this is, I've, I think I've said this. Even this, so this is, the, this is the thing that I've personally been struggling with, like Pizzagate, for example. That is hard to understand. That is really a long way away from what might seem plausible. I think, uh, you know, and this is that Hillary Clinton and others are running, have run an enormous. I mean, it's just it's too awful to even say, like a uh, thing out of the basement of a uh, pizza place in DC called Comet Ping Pong, I think, and um, which doesn't have a basement, for example. Like that's a kind of a blow to that story, but doesn't stop people, and we'll come back to it. But it's that perhaps the only thing I can kind of get there is, is that the demonization of her has been, you know, been going since the early 90s, and it just, 
got her into this category of evil that made anything seem possible. Uh, well, maybe it's mostly it's 99% bots saying it and 1% people actually believing it. So that's a question, like how far can you stretch away from, you know, the truth? And we've, we've been primed at different points in, in, in history to believe certain things. I don't know if any of you watched that New York Times. Uh, it, was some, it was in opinion, actually, but, um, and I have a link to it, I think, on uh, disinformation by uh, Russia going back into the 80s. And the first piece, there's three videos. The first one they concentrate on is, they concentrate on the, um, this story, this conspiracy theory that uh, AIDS was created by a U.S., like CIA something, you know, hidden factory or whatever that was trying to create um, bioweapons and it spilled out and something, right? So it's like the U.S. started it. And there's various elaborations. They did an interesting thing where they, they planted the story in English-speaking papers really around the fringe of the English-speaking world. So in Thailand and India, for example, in smaller papers, just kept planting them and eventually it kind of trickled up. And eventually Dan Rather, very, you know, famous and stately kind of character is talking about it on CBS. Um, not saying it's true, but just sort of talking about it and trying to contend with this thing. It's, it's gotten enough you know, power for it. So we'll talk more about conspiracy theories. So that's a framing for what I think this adjacent narrative piece is. Um, and, and it's sort of a existence argument for, or an argument for the existence of bad stories, right? And it's just that there is an insane, there's whatever really happened, there's not just a few narratives around it, there's an infinitude of them, and it grows super exponentially as you move away from the real one. So you're going to be able to find better stories that will spread better, um, that are somewhat faithful to the real one, you know, truncated, they have to be compressed in some way. But you could also very likely find a, a, an adjacent story that is wrong, you know, but fits in with some ideology that you have and you can, you know. And people work hard to spin things, for sure. They really do. Uh, this one, hopefully you can. You're the one who said you walked on the moon when you didn't. So. Calling the kettle black, if ever thought of saying you that you're getting my way from me. You're a coward and a liar and a thief. So this Buzz Aldrin, I think in his late 80s, Gushing a guy who is telling him he never walked on the moon. So <laughs> he walked on the moon. Um, <laughs> that's a guy who worked on the moon, right? So this is, I don't know what this, I, don't, I haven't looked it up, I haven't updated this, but this is a guy, I don't know if they've asked this question. This is apparently 6% of American, right, in 1999 said they were fake, right? This is a, one of the more famous conspiracy theories. Um, I was still, uh, yeah, I hadn't been born. Um, uh, and uh, right, you, the, the, all these sorts of things. Where you go into the video, and because it's not a great video, you can see the reflection of the, you know, the best boy or the gaffer or something like this. Right? Whatever. There's some argument about. You can see the. It's a sound stage in Los Angeles. Uh, you know, I mean, and that seems sort of. Well, he had to punch. <laughs> um, it, it, you know, got to a real. He didn't have to, but he chose to. It got to a real, you know, this got to a physical situation. Um, yeah, that guy's been a, a real problem. The comments are pretty hilarious too. I, I don't think it's worth, um, that's the, on YouTube. Always dangerous, but, um, so you, you might want to look at them later on. Uh, anyway, so 5% were undecided. This is kind of amazing, right? I mean, this is amazing. This is something that people around the world watched, right? Everyone, anyone could get near a TV, they, descent upon this was a massive global event you know uh, and he, he said it's it's there's one full one small step for for man like the a he said a man but it got chopped out in the communication so his, his great one-liner didn't work so other conspiracy theories sort of in the similar category uh, JK Rowling doesn't exist we'll come back to this with fame the idea with this one and this is a Norwegian uh, journalist I think actually it's just saying that um, it just doesn't make any sense that someone could have written all these books and they could have sold, like it's not possible, right? It's not, it's not possible, which is a fundamental misunderstanding of humans, right? I mean, it's just like an, and social phenomena, right? 
I mean, one of the big things that I think comes out of stuff we've many people have done the last two is that the understanding that billions of people can be harmoniously wrong about something, like wrong, or just you know happily in agreement about something that you know if you run the world again doesn't doesn't come out that way. So we'll we'll show that on Tuesday. So the Earth is flat. This is an ongoing ridiculousness, right? That you can find all sorts of good stuff. Uh, Kyrie Irving, who's right now with uh, with the Celtics, um, interviews very confusing interviews where he's like. Hmm. Maybe it's a guy who flies on planes. You know, people take pictures out of planes and they show that there's sort of a horizon that looks flat. And they're like, see, it's flat. Elaborate arguments as to why the sun is round or, you know, a sphere and the moon is a sphere, but the earth is flat. Which is true in Pratchett's books, right? It's actually a disc sitting on four elephants on a turtle. But anyway, there's nothing under the turtle. So the Beatles never existed. You know, that's a good one. Look, website. Um, there's this one. Right, and here it is, right? So is, how is it possible that someone could do this, right? Right? How is it possible? It just doesn't make any sense. So it's a, an argument. Actually, it totally does make sense. That's how people, yes, yes it is. Um, <laughs> that's how we work. Uh, phantom, this is a good one, phantom time hypothesis. Uh, so these years didn't exist, right? This is good. This is really well done. Um, these are just, they just didn't exist. And the, the claim is that, so we'll get rid of 297 years. Uh, this, they wanted to live in the 1,000 one AD. They wanted to see the clock turn over, right, from 999 to 1000 because that would be good stuff. Uh, so we're actually living in 1820 right now, if this is true. <laughs> um, so this is good to, oh, 1821, good to know. So, uh, and it was, uh, this, is the, this is the claim, right? So this is, I don't know when this was made up, but this is, of course, the handles that uh, you had the Roman emperor and the pope at the time, and they wanted to live in 1000 AD and make a big story of it, you know, and, and, and have power. Uh, but, you know, we actually had to sort of, people had to kind of dig out all sorts of, um, you know, evidence to show this wasn't true because it was a pretty good one. You know, it was a long time ago. But there are these sorts of things, right? De um, trees help us out, things that hit the planet and, um, you know, records of solar eclipses around the, because the whole thing is a big clock, basically, the solar system, we're able to, um, well, this doesn't, you know, anyone who wants to believe this, this is not going to help. <laughs> That's one thing we've also come to understand, right? Actual information is not. More information, more numbers does not help, right? So, yeah. You have to be really careful with how you couch numbers. People get confused, you know, about one over 100 versus one over 1,000. Like the 1,000 is bigger than 100, so they go the wrong way. It's pretty bad. This is a good one. Finland doesn't exist. Um, just doesn't exist. Uh, Japanese fishing colony, right? So that's a claim. Um, East and Sweden. I don't know. There's one for Australia. Australia doesn't exist. That's just made up. Yep. Um, anyway, so, uh, all right. So that's, you know, there, there are these kind of fun ones, and then there is, you know, conspiracy theories where it goes, you know, into obviously very evil, bad, bad ways. And you can, because they're just stories, you know, people are going to, they're just, they're just in people's heads. You know, it's, this is pretty lightweight, actually. Now we've got the apparatus of the web. Well, the internet to, you know, add, you know, videos which seem to be evidence of something, you know, people going through, say, the fall of the, the World Trade Tower, right, the, the you know, 9-11, right, detailing how you can see something and jet fuel. And so, I mean, this, we lived there, right? So, I mean, I remember the first time I ever saw someone hold up a, it was actually in Church Street with a placard saying 9-11 didn't exist. You know, and I didn't, right. I mean, I, I, I kind of wanted to kill them. But um, it was deeply upsetting, you know, because anyway. So, but it was also shocking because I'm like, what, what is going on? Like, how did this, now I'm fully prepared. Like something bad happens and you know there will be this kind of flourishing of anti-stories around it for whatever purpose, right? There will be all sorts of stuff that will pop up and you just, you just sort of wait to see them. And what we want to be able to do is kind of quantify them and say they're wrong in some way. That's... You know, what's the, what's the vaccine? Of course, vaccines are in trouble. What's the vaccine for, because we have stories against that, what's the vaccine for conspiracy theories? You know, it seems at the moment we have like Snopes, which is like one website with people writing little things. It's not a big organization. And obviously this can then be gamed itself and da 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 right? right? I mean, you would think education would be one thing, so we should do that. 
public education should be a big deal. Um, but what, how do we do this, right? So CNN, I think, or maybe MSNBC has now started to show things where they fact check on the side. They try to put up you know, actual data. You know, if someone says something politically, and then they'll try to put up some real facts next to it. You know, and that could be hard to do in real time. But at least it stops you from just becoming a mouthpiece of you know, saying things that just aren't true. Uh, OK, so this, is, this, is, you know, this piece is about the, uh, the importance of, of, of the power of stories in, in, in what they do for us, right? And they, they go for all sorts of levels. Uh, parasocial relationships, so if you link to this, so cosplay, for example. But this is about how people become deeply connected to, to characters in books and movies and so on. So if someone, or a TV show, if someone, die, you know, someone dies in a TV show, it has, can have really quite serious real effects on people, right, in terms of uh, how they react. They react in ways that they would, very similar to actually having someone they know pass away. Uh, this is... Uh, this is a podcast, The Illusionist, which I quite like. It's Helen Zaltzman from the UK. It connects into this piece, uh, talking about using novels as therapy, getting people to read novels. And, the, and this is a nice part of this, right, is that you can present all sorts of things to people for therapy, like factual stuff and, and hero methods. But the, the, the power of the novel uh, is that it doesn't tell you anything straight up. It, you, you know it's fictional, right? So there's an aspect of being disarmed because you're just reading some stories, right? But you know, we take on the stories that, that we kind of wash ourselves in to some extent. Uh, and so, you know, that's what's there. That's at the individual level. And then they sort of zoom out and suggest that Agatha Christie kind of mo um, novels, which flourished after the First World War, were kind of doing that therapeutic act at the level of a, a nation. This is, and this is for England in particular. But there were, you know, so a bad thing happens in these stories, um, and, but it's usually not too super gruesome, right? It's not because the, the First World War, what was called the Great War at the time, was, you know, a, a, a horror of all horrors, right? And it was unclear it would ever end. Um, but, you know, people, you know, it was incredibly traumatizing for, for, for a whole you know, generation. So these things have something bad happen in them. But, and there's a mystery, and you kind of have to figure it out. And Agatha Christie famously very hard to figure out. But you know, there's, you know where it's going to end, right? They're going to get caught. It's going to be solved. It's going to be um, clarity, right? There's not going to be randomness or madness. The world will have um, some sense. So that's an interesting piece here. And this is just one example. Um, I mean, if you think about tiny little or, or small catchphrase type stories, you know, the, the um, American dream is rags to riches, right? So that's a little... That's a story that exists in people's heads, at least. Uh, the extent to which it's true and the extent to which people believe in it, both of those things are you know, in flux. Uh, but they're, they're things that make a you know, culture drive in a certain way. Representation matters, right? So um, hodology is, the, is uh, the study of paths made by animals, but also networks, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so this is this, you know, we, we we worry about this very reasonably, right? I mean, and, and it's but it's an interesting thing that we do this usually on the positive side, right? So that we would like to have, um, you know, minorities and balances of gender and so on in shows because you know we want people to be able to see that they can do things. You know, that's often talked about in a very positive way, and and uh, and it's true. But then there's a dark side to it, of course, right? Where we where we we represent terrible things. Uh, and usually the framing, you know, and I'd like to sort of quantify this in a large way, the framing around these sorts of stories is just entertainment. Like it doesn't have any effect on people, right? And you get into a lot of trouble if you say violent video games cause people to do things, right? Like Japan has violent video games, but nothing ever happens there, and the US has them. You know, that doesn't make any sense. But there's clear, in terms of stories and algorithms and way to, to do things, that there's a massive learning um, process that happens, say, within these extreme cases, right? So, um, you know, this is, this is, a, this is a natural born killer is a movie. It's just completely a movie, and it became a uh, verb for, for the Columbine um, kids. Terrible thing, absolutely terrible thing, uh, but, but, you know, I, representation works on both ways, right? 
And it just seems in general, this is, this is where people are very happy to say, oh, you know, positive things, great, you know, like really good, you know, and, and uh, like Gina Davis, for example, has a, um, her, um, uh, what is it, her uh, group, I suppose, uh, works on, you know, counting up basically how many times, you know, like male and female voices are in um, popular movies, for example. You can do some stuff now with, you know, looking at faces, right? You can just do it more automatically. Um, there's the Bechdel test, right? So Alison Bechdel, who lives out at Bolton, who's a um, MacArthur genius for cartoons, for comics. I shouldn't say cartoons, for comics. Uh, it's not actually, it's another one of these um, uh, things that are not named after the right um, person. Um, is that uh, it's a test for a, a movie or a book or whatever it is. Do two, do two female characters talk to each other um, separately and not about men? Like, does that even happen in a movie? And, you know, so there are various versions of that test. Uh, anyway, she didn't come up with it, and she keeps saying I didn't come up with it, but anyway, it's named after her. Um, so you can make those tests, you know, things where people have to annotate things, or we can, we're getting to a point where we can kind of do some of it, um, you know, algorithmically, and then, you know, process a ton of data. Okay. There is a whole list, though, you know, there's the copycat crimes where they explicitly connect back. They, the people involved explicitly talk about um, this. So, so we, we have an awareness of it, but we're really focused on that. So this is, this is some aspect of saying the power of um, the effect on these, uh, right, the Joker was involved in, in Colorado. This is a book that just came out um, that goes more strongly, uh, perhaps, in this direction, right? So the written world, literature, so this is the how salt changed the universe, um, literature shaped civilization. But I think this is fair enough, right? How cod, you know, made the new world the new world. Um, anyway, but it's this, uh, you know, storytelling is, you know, it's this basic thing that we, fundamental thing we do, and I mean, it's how we propagate culture and so on. Um, and so this book is, this fellow, he's a professor at Harvard, goes around the world, uh, that's what he does, he travels around the world, goes to places where these famous stories um, were developed and I guess somehow tries to experience what it's like to be there now. But I found this, uh, I couldn't really get past much of this because he talks about himself too much. Um, so that's a shame. Um, yeah, and the New York Times review for this is like, oh, this is fantastic, it's so interesting, that's the review there. There's a, just a tiny bit at the end, like, oh, this could go wrong. You know, like stories could, could go wrong. We could maybe get large groups of people to do terrible things. Um, right. But it's, again, this happens over and over and over. And I guess the word story, probably in most people's minds, it seems a bit soft, right? But um, the, you, you'll see a lot of framings where it starts off with stories are for fun, da, 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 da. But they're also kind of important, you know? And it's, yeah, right. Actually, no, they just drove everything you did. Um, uh, that's a, that, that's, yeah, yep, yeah. okay, good. Okay, so I'm going to come back on Tuesday and talk about uh, these things. Um, I will give you one more piece here. Uh, there's, how much money? Oh, it doesn't show. All right, so this is a podcast is from On the Media, which I quite like. Um, and this is a, a journalist who was caught by, who was held captive by ISIS for 10 months. So let me just look at this, right? So he talks about his experience like being in a movie, right? And maybe, you know, we're too saturated by cult, um, you know, popular culture to, that that's a problem, right? So people see themselves as movie characters, um, right? And so this is why he thinks the most powerful way to fight ISIS is not with bombs, but to kill the narrative, right? We have to write another movie. Um, you know, narratives lead to bombs is the way to think about it, perhaps. Uh, and... So he, and he's talking about the French, he's French, so he's talking about they're making big mistakes in doing this. Uh, social media name, stop this and this, da, 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 right? So they try to do this. Uh, uh, I, don't, I don't understand why we are so bad, because in France we don't know how to write TV series properly. Um, it's interesting. Uh, we have no imagination, we cannot tell beautiful stories, create So it is a problem, right? I mean, the French have been wandering around saying, you know, nothing matters, you know, life is... Uh, uh, meaningless and whatever for a long time. And that's not a compelling story, right? But we're French and we have lovely food. So, and lovely architecture. So, you know, what's the story of your culture, right? And 
you know, because people have left the West, right? They've left their dire circumstances in the West and traveled long distances to, to join ISIS. Because, and, and not because, you know, because of stories, right? Because of stories. And, you know, now we have stories coming back of some people for whom that was terrible, some people for whom that was, you know, that was, they enjoy, you know, they, were, they became very much part of it. Right? Um, you know, what do people want, right? They want to become heroes. It's a little strong. They want to become famous. They want to be recognized. But um, that's, a, that's a realization that this is the case. But, uh, uh, yeah, so we'll come back to that. All right. Um, I know we just sort of have to stop in the middle of this, but that's okay. So stories are a big deal is what I want to say. Okay. All right. Did we get all the voting done? Yeah? Good work. Thank you.